<laughs> there can be no doubt about our close relationship to these chimpanzees. Our bodies are so similar. The proportions of our limbs or our faces may differ, but otherwise we are very, very similar. The arrangement of our internal organs, the chemistry of our blood, the way our bodies work, all these are almost identical, and DNA confirms that. Indeed, we are as closely related to chimpanzees and the rest of the apes and monkeys as, say, lions are to tigers and to the rest of the cat family. Over a long period of time. That would only work if each stage of development was an improvement on the previous one. And today, we know enough about the animal kingdom to know that that is indeed the case. Some very simple animals have nothing more than light-sensitive spots that enable them to tell the difference between light and dark. But if a patch of such spots formed even the shallowest of pits, one edge of the pit would throw a shadow and so reveal the direction of light. If the pit got deeper and started to close, then light would form a blurred image. Mucus secreted by the cells would bend the light and focus it. If this mucus hardened, it would form a proper lens and transmit a brighter and clearer image. All these different fully functional stages at different levels of complexity are found in living animals today. This single-celled creature has one of those light-sensitive spots. Flatworms have a small pit containing light spots, so they can detect the shadow of a predator. A snail's blurry vision is good enough to enable it to find its way to food. And the octopus has an eye with a proper lens and can see as much detail as we can. So the structure of the human eye does not demand the assistance of a supernatural designer. It can have evolved gradually with each stage bringing a real advantage, as Darwin's theory demands. Natural selection, of course, requires that an animal's characteristics are handed from one generation to the next. It's obvious that children resemble their parents. Anyone knows that. But when you come to think of it, how does that come about? In Darwin's time, nobody had the faintest idea about the mechanism or the rules that govern that process, except perhaps for one man who was working in the city of Brno, in what is now the Czech Republic, at exactly the same time that Darwin was writing his book in Kent. That man's name was Gregor Mendel. He discovered the laws of inheritance by breeding thousands of pea plants and observing how they changed from one generation to the next. He found that while many characteristics were passed down directly from one generation to another, others could actually skip a generation. How could that happen? Mendel explained this by suggesting that each plant, each organism, contained within it factors which were responsible for creating those particular characteristics. Today, we call those things genes but nobody had any idea how they worked until a hundred years after Mendel's time.
In 1953, here in the Cavendish Laboratories, two young researchers, Francis Crick and James Watson, were building models like this. It was their way of thinking about and investigating the structure of a complex molecule that's found in the genes of all animals, DNA. The crucial bit are these chains which encircle the rod. And here is a second and entwine. This is the double helix. The workings of the DNA molecule are now understood in such detail that we can demonstrate something that is truly astounding. A gene taken from one animal can function in another. The gene that causes the jellyfish to be luminous, for example, transplanted into a mouse will make that mouse luminous. Suddenly, an image from our remote past comes vividly to light. The time when our distant ancestors, in order to keep up with the changing environment, had to wade and keep their heads above water in order to find food. That crucial moment when our far distant ancestors took a step away from being apes and a step towards humanity.